Grace and peace to you, my friends, and welcome to GB 102, Bible Backgrounds. I am Corey Ellen, and for the next eight weeks, I will be your instructor for this course. In this orientation presentation, we, were, we will discuss the syllabus. We will discuss some of the class expectations, some of the assignments, and some of our class policies. So, if you're ready, go ahead and strap yourselves in, because we don't have much time, and this train is going to have to leave the station. So, I guess it's only fair that I begin by introducing myself. My name is Corey Allen, and I admit that Alwyn is a very weird sounding last name, at least to most Americans. Because this name is so odd, most of the people I meet usually mispronounce it. So now, after 30 years of having been called Owen, Owen, Avon, and even Allen, I've simply just given up on people calling me Mr. Alwyn correctly. So, for the rest of this class, you may address me either in person or in writing as Professor Corey. I feel that this is sufficiently respectful and is a good way of addressing me because, well, simply put, I just like the sound of my first name better anyway. Now, if you've read the syllabus, you may have already noted that I am not a doctor. At my current rate of study, I won't complete my doctorate until the summer of 2016. So. Until then, the title of Professor Corey will have to suffice. Well, with that being said, though, I would like to reassure you that I have studied the Bible long enough that I will be able to show you a few things that you didn't know before. Currently, I have three degrees in the field of biblical studies. One is an associate's degree, one is a bachelor's degree, and one is a master's degree. And my specialization at the master's level is in the cultural settings of the Bible, which just so happens to be one of the major components that we will focus on in this course. So, simply put, I promise you, you will get your money's worth out of this class. So, after this lecture, I would like you to go to the introductions form on the LMS, and I would like you to tell the rest of the class some things about yourself, including five important facts about yourself. Now, these are going to have to be facts that everyone needs to know if they want to understand your life. And this will help the other students understand that you're more than just a name on the computer screen. That you're a person who has goals, dreams, aspirations, just like them. In short, it will help you, us to recognize that you are a human being created in God's image, and not some robot that I have simply programmed to give interesting or challenging answers. And so, I'll start this off by giving my five important facts. The first one is, I was married in 2002, and I've remained that way up until the present. My wife's name is Charlotte, and we currently have no children, but between the two of us, we do have eight degrees, so we will gladly show you pictures of all of the diplomas that we've acquired instead of kids if you're just that kind of person that just has to look at other people's family photo albums. Secondly, for over 20 years now, I've been playing music. I started playing bass guitar when I was in sixth grade, and I've played in numerous bands, worship groups, and other types of musical ensembles over these years. I appreciate that music allows me to express myself in ways that I just feel like words cannot. I often feel that my praise and worship to God and before God is at its most genuine and transparent when I'm performing as an instrumentalist. And currently, I am pursuing a doctorate in the field of Christian worship. So, from time to time, we will discuss aspects of worship as both a biblical and a cultural phenomenon in this course. My third defining fact is that my favorite physical activity is hiking. I particularly enjoy hiking to view waterfalls, and I've seen most of the major waterfalls in Western Virginia by now. Um, specifically, I enjoy nature photography, and so I've often been known to go to great lengths to get pictures of very pretty places or wild animals in their natural habitat. My fourth defining fact is that my favorite season of all of the seasons is winter, and I very strongly dislike hot weather, and I just become kind of physically inactive during summer and spring and become more active during fall and winter, and I will I'll warn you now, I will routinely pray for snow, and so I apologize in advance that if it does snow during this semester, it's probably my fault for praying for it. And I know you're going to ask, yes, you still owe me your work submitted on time, even in the case of a snowstorm, because this is an online class, and you don't have to travel anywhere. And lastly, the most important fact you probably need to know about me, other than the fact that I'm a Christian, is that 
I'm a nerd. And I come to this conclusion by asserting that my personality is a special blend of intelligence, obsession for geeky things, and downright social ineptitude. I.e., I'm much more comfortable talking in one-on-one in small groups than I am in a very large crowd. I enjoy reading. I usually read between 1 to 200 pages a day. I enjoy sci-fi movies, anime, video games. I even cosplay from time to time. So, in short, I fit almost every nerdy stereotype you can think of for our culture. And I'm quite proud to wear that designation. So, now you're probably wondering, how do I get a hold of this nerdy professor during the next eight weeks? Well, the easiest way is to send me a message directly through the LMS. However, I do check my MacU uh, email and my Facebook on a daily basis, so I am amenable to being contacted this way at well. If you need to call, I have a cell phone turned on between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m., and all calls that come in after the 9 p.m. deadline will be returned on the next day. I also keep office hours at MacU on Monday afternoons between 1 p.m. and 6 p.m., so feel free to visit in person during those times as well. If you must meet with me at an odd time for some reason or another, make an appointment via email, and I'll try to make as most of an effort as I can to accommodate your request. Also, as per the student-teacher covenant within our syllabus, I will respond to your emails and phone calls within a 24-hour period. If you make an appointment with me, I will keep it 100% of the time, and I will grade all work within seven days. So now that you know a little bit about me, let's talk about this class that you've signed up for. According to the school catalog, this class is a study of the historical, geographical, political, social, and cultural settings of the New and Old Testament. This course seeks to provide students with a context that will enhance your understanding of biblical texts and promote further biblical studies and affirm the historical reliability of the scriptures. Whew, and all of that for three credit hours. If I may attempt to put that into layman's terms for you here in a, for a second, this class will discuss history, geography, and culture, and specifically those three aspects of the Bible. And I will attempt to present this material to you in an orderly fashion so that you'll be able to see the connections between these three fields, history, geography, and culture, and you'll be able to put it together in a package. And my goal is to help you use all of that information so that you'll be reading your Bible better. Additionally, the course catalog states that this is a three credit hour class. And this translates to approximately 135 hours of total work time for this semester. Now, this wouldn't be so bad if the class was spaced over 16 weeks, like a normal in-house session. But we only have eight weeks to play with, and this means that you'll have to average about 17 hours of work per week in order to keep up with the assigned readings, listening to the lectures, posting to the discussion boards, and working on your projects. This is the equivalent of a part-time job, my friends. So you will need to manage your time very, very carefully if we're going to complete this class successfully. Or if I may put this bluntly, the online version of GB102 Bible Backgrounds, this class, is more intense and demanding than the in-class version because it covers the same amount of material, it has roughly the same amount of work, but only half the time. So, at this point, if that hasn't scared you off running for your ad drop slip yet, you will want to download the syllabus from the LMS, the Learning Management System, if you haven't done so already. Now. I apologize for the length of this document. Usually I like to have a much shorter syllabi when I teach on class, on-site classes, but since I can't be there in person to walk you through all this information, I've had to provide you with a rather exhaustive document. So for the next set of slides, we will cover the highlights of the syllabus, giving particular detail to the textbooks that are assigned and the assignments that are required for class. So let's define and refine our course description a bit so that you can begin to understand what my expectations will be. In terms of Bloom's taxonomy, this class is a knowledge-based course. Issues of critical thinking, life application, worldview synthesis, while important, will unfortunately take a back seat in this class so that 
I can cram as much information and knowledge into your head as humanly possible. Simply put, we have a mountain of data to cover in these eight short weeks, and by the time you're finished, you will probably feel like you've drank gallons and gallons of liquid knowledge straight from a fire hose. This being said, there are some specific types of knowledge that I am wanting you to acquire during this time. And the first type of knowledge is geographical knowledge. Students will become well acquainted with the maps of the ancient Near East and specifically the Levant. They will be able to locate biblical sites, trade routes, geopolitical boundaries, all of which are relevant to the study of the Bible. And we're going to test this by doing what I call map quizzes and we'll be gauging your ability to incorporate maps by showing that you can do so on your final project. Now, the second type of knowledge you will acquire is chronological knowledge, or knowledge of time. And students in this class will develop a comprehensive understanding of chronology and be able to appropriately place Bible figures and the composition of Bible books into their proper time frame of reference. And this will be tested by your ability to chart biblical eras and persons of interest on a timeline. Now, the next form of knowledge you will acquire is historical knowledge. And students in this class will learn the basic parameters of salvation history. The German word for this is Heilsgeschichte. Basically, you'll be able to explain how God has been an active agent throughout human history and specifically as it is recorded in the scriptures. The student will also be able to explain how the Word of God, i.e. the Bible, is an inspired document and accurately reports God's interactions with human beings. And all of this will be tested via objective questions and essay-style questions on your quizzes. The last type of knowledge that you will master for this course is cultural knowledge of the ancient Near East. Students will become familiar with the cultural values, beliefs, and customs that made up the ancient Near Eastern worldview, and special attention will be given to how the Israelites, as God's chosen people, fit into this cultural matrix through participation. And by participation I mean that when they accepted the ancient Near Eastern worldview, and by their polemics, and by this I mean when they challenged the ancient Near Eastern worldview, and all of this will be tested on quiz questions and also by your ability to integrate cultural knowledge into your final project. Furthermore, since this is an online class, you will have adequate time to express yourself and develop your communication skills by answering discussion questions and posting your answers to our LMS internet forums. Students will practice written communication with their peers on topics pertinent to the study of Bible backgrounds, and this will culminate in a final project where the student will produce a substantial audiovisual presentation where you are expounding on a Bible passage, and you'll be using the knowledge and methods taught in this class. So, at the end of this orientation lecture, I will present to you a modest example of what such a project could look like. Additionally, every week I will be introducing you to a wide variety of scholarly resources to help you do college-level work in the field of biblical studies. Students will become familiar with a wide assortment of Bible study aids and resources that are available both in electronic and in print formats. Throughout this course, though, students will be taught the proper usage of these study tools, and you'll begin to develop critical assessment skills for determining what makes a resource a good resource, what makes a resource a bad resource. And this will be tested by how thoroughly a student is able to integrate that information into the resources of their final project and their timeline. Still with me? Whew, good. Okay, our final objective that we'll have is going to basically come down to a real life test to see if you can juggle all of this information I'm going to throw at you this semester. In this course, you'll be introduced to what is known as the historical critical method of biblical interpretation. And a student who successfully completes this course will be able to expound upon this axiom or slogan. The Bible is important to us today, but it was not written directly to us today. And students will furthermore be able to use their knowledge of geography, 
chronology, history, and culture to begin bridging the gaps between the ancient world of the Bible and our modern world today. So finally, in addition to all of those learning outcomes, I do want to save just a little bit of time each week for your spiritual formation. You see, as a pastor, I'm also concerned that you are gaining knowledge and that you're growing in your walk with Jesus Christ. And as a result, each week there will be several opportunities for you to see how the course material applies directly to your spiritual walk. Now, because spiritual growth is personal, and like salvation, I can't force you to pursue it, this learning outcome won't be tested or measured, save that I hope and pray that you find those portions of the class edifying and that it does encourage your faith walk towards God, towards Jesus, and towards more knowledge in the Holy Spirit of what it means to be a Christian. So you got all that. All right, now with all of those goals in mind, you're probably beginning to wonder, oh goodness, how am I even going to get there from here? Well, the first and most important tool that you can cultivate for this journey is a love for reading. In this course, I have assigned you three different textbooks, all totaling about 1,000 pages of reading. Now, while this would only take me about a weekend to read myself, I'm not going to assume that you read at my pace. So, I will be assigning you weekly readings from your textbooks, and these will average about 125 pages per week. Also, you would do well to keep up with these readings because I will try to pace the class so that as you are doing your weekly readings, they will reinforce the things we are learning in class itself. So, our primary textbook for this class is the Holman Bible Atlas by Thomas Briscoe. This book has won numerous evangelical Christian awards for scholarship and quality. It also just happens to come with your Logos Bible software that Dr. Fields requires for all of his Bible classes. So if you already have a copy of the Logos software, you don't need to purchase this book again. And the benefit of having it on the Logos software is that you can search the book topically or search for key words, which will save you quite a lot of time when compared for having to check back uh, with the index and then find the page number and do that over and over again. So. Each week, you will have an assigned reading for this book, and they will be notated uh, in your class notes like this. Briscoe, which is the author's last name, comma, pages, and then whatever pages I would like you to read for that week. So, our next text is entitled Ancient Near Eastern Thought in the Old Testament by John H. Walden. And this book deals with a discipline that is known as comparative Semitics, or the comparative study of ancient Near Eastern languages. Simply put, the Bible is not the only type of literature that was produced by the cultures of the ancient Near East. And sometimes, some of the greatest challenges to the traditional interpretations of the Bible have come from these scholars who compare the biblical text with these ancient documents that were written by the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Canaanites, and others. So, Walton is a conservative Old Testament scholar, but he's also a master of a lot of this other ancient literature and this book will help you to see the connections, both with regards to how the Bible is unique and in ways that it is similar to this ancient Near Eastern literature. Now, I will stress this from the beginning. I do not agree with everything that Walton says in this book, and I'm quite certain you won't agree with everything either. I have assigned this book, though, because his scholarship is extremely thorough. And it will be eye-opening for you to see some of the directions where this evidence points. So, I just request, read it critically. And I am certain that it will enlighten your reading of the Bible, and it will challenge you to rethink some of your assumptions about the Old Testament. And our final textbook for the class is a classic in every sense of the word. You see, about a generation after Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead, a Jewish man named Josephus penned two of the most important historical accounts of the Jewish people, Antiquities of the Jews and the Jewish Wars. For historians, these books became the necessary starting place for understanding the Jewish world during the New Testament era. So, in this book, Josephus discusses things like, where did the Pharisees and the Sadducees come from? He describes all the reasons why the Jews and the Samaritans don't get along. He even discusses reasons why the Jews were expecting their Messiah to be a military leader who would be able to defeat the Romans. 
So in this book, uh, which was edited by Paul Meyer, it is abridged. And by that, it means that a lot of the fluffy stuff has been cut out. I did not assign you a full-length copy of Josephus for a couple of reasons. The biggest being, such versions are in Old English, and they're just downright hard to read. But a second reason is that these translations tend to be very long. My copy is about 900 pages. So, in respect, for both your time and your limited patience, I have directed you to a book that cuts to the chase to the important stuff in Josephus' works and will help you to read the Bible better without bogging you down with names and places that really won't help in that matter. So, keep in mind, a professional Bible scholar is expected to have read this book and the unabridged version and probably read it multiple times. So, if you're considering a career in biblical studies, this book will provide you a gateway to the historiography of the New Testament era. So now, let's talk about the LMS for a second. The acronym LMS stands for Learning Management System, and it's the computer program and website that you're currently using to view this lecture. Now, most of our course materials, including our lectures, our maps, our quizzes, etc., etc., can all be found on this website. It's at http colon slash slash www.maculogin.com, and that's all one word, M-A-C-U-L-O-G-I-N.com. Just sign in with your username and remember your password and click on the course entitled GB102 and you'll be flying. Also, note that the expectations for the quality of work in the LMS group discussions may differ slightly from the minimal requirements for attendance. So, check with the resources link in the LMS uh, for the university library information, your academic support information, tutorials, and other resources such as the academic honor code, writing styles uh, and disciplinary policies, and disability services just in case you need to avail yourself to those things. If you are not able to log into the LMS and you're having technical difficulties, you may email the help desk at itsupport at macuniversity.edu or you can call them directly at 252-334-2014. Of course, I'm telling you this somewhat humorously because if you are listening to this lecture at all, you probably have your LMS totally figured out just fine. Way to go, Tiger. Now, as I'm sure you could guess, this class takes place online. And there's no way for us to have a traditional lecture where I talk for 45 minutes and you can raise your hand and interrupt at any time and respond to my ideas and ask questions. So to make up for this, our class will rely on discussion boards that facilitate student-to-teacher and student-to-student -student dialogues. Participation in these forums is crucial, i.e. mandatory, to your learning experience, and failure to participate in three or more weeks will result in being dropped in the class. You will contribute to one discussion forum per week, and you will respond to one of your peers' posts once per week as well. So all totaled up, all of these responses will be 10% of your final grade. Not a lot on their own, but they do add up. And since this is to be discussion, you will begin by answering one of the questions that I have proposed. Normally, I will expect these responses to be about 250 to 300 words in length. The first post is due Wednesday night at 11.59 p.m. And then your peers will also answer my questions, and so you'll read their responses throughout the week. And as you read them, you will post a peer response, which will be due on Sunday nights at 11.59 p.m. And this peer response should be shorter, about 150 to 250 words long. So you got that? Initial response due Wednesday night. Second response, do Sunday night, and we will repeat this process for eight weeks. Now, the bulk of your grade, and I mean 40% of your grade, will come from quizzes. As promised, this class will be heavily oriented towards the acquisition of knowledge, and the best way to make sure that you're getting all this knowledge in your head is to quiz you regularly. So, every week, you will have a quiz. And each quiz will be worth 5% of your grade. So please, take these quizzes seriously, because even one failed quiz can drop you by more than half a letter grade. So, additionally, there's no cumulative final exam. So, your 8th week quiz will cover only the material you learned during the 8th week. And one quiz a week will be due on Fridays at 11.59pm. So plan your time accordingly. 
Furthermore, you will have a 35 minute limit for each quiz, so plan to spend the bulk of your time working on the essay question. Now as far as structure goes, each quiz will be uniform in structure. You will be given one or more maps and you'll be asked to identify the areas marked A through J. So 10 things I want you to identify. And for those 10 questions, there will be a list of 18 possible answers to choose from. There will be 10 correct, 8 wrong, and no answers will be used multiple times. And after the map questions, you will be given 10 multiple choice questions, and this will test your historical and your cultural knowledge that you've gained during the week. You will also want to pick up um, the uh, option that is the best answer. So, for example, if I've given you several choices that look correct, then your best answer would probably be answer D or E, the one that implies like A and C are correct, for example. And so finally, you'll, the quiz will conclude with an essay question, and I'll expect these essay questions to be answered in complete sentences, using about 100 to 200 words. And these questions will test how well you've processed the information during the week. So for the next 10% of your grade, that will come down to book reviews for two of your textbooks, Walton's Ancient Near Eastern Thought in the Old Testament and Meyer's translation of Josephus. Now, for each book review, I'm expecting a three to four page review. And at about 250 to 300 words per page, each review should be about 900 to 1200 words in length. And since this is technically a history class, I am regarding these I am requiring that these reviews be done in what is known as the Turabian style or the Chicago manual of style. Now, if you've never written in this format before, or if you have and you're just unsure of how it works, you can always download a Word document from the LMS. It's uh, entitled Sample Style Sheet for the Chicago Manual of Style dot doc. And this document will give you a short sample of what the Chicago style looks like. It's written by Dr. James North, and it will provide you with numerous insights for how to format a Turabian style paper. Now, with regard to content, I do not want you to spend all three or four pages telling me a summary of these books. I've read both of them multiple times, and I already know what they say. What I'm looking for from you is a short summary where you highlight the thesis and the goals of the book. This summary should take no more than a page. After that, I want you to analyze the book for the next two to three pages. Did the author accomplish his goals that he set about to demonstrate in the thesis? Was the logic of the author consistent throughout the book? Did the author make a convincing argument? If so, why? If not, why not? And this is the level of interaction that I'm expecting from you from these book reviews. And now for some of the big heavy hitters. For 15% of your grade, we will do a timeline project. You see, every week I will be sharing a timeline with the class. And the primary reason for this is because, for most people, the Bible is simply just a book written long ago in a faraway land. Numbers like 1446 BC don't really have much meaning to such people because they don't yet have an established framework for understanding such a number. So, by the fifth week in class, you too will produce a timeline, and I want this timeline to demonstrate the following factors. Firstly, I want your timeline to be accurate. Your timeline project will need to have accurate dates that can be confirmed by a scholarly source. And I understand that most study Bibles have timelines in them these days, but I don't want you to just take their word for it. I want you to research this for yourself. And in some cases, you may have to take a guess. And when that happens, please mark your timeline with what's known as a circuit date. For example, you would put the letter C dot 1805 BC. And this will let me know that you're aware that the date is not certain and that you're taking your best guess. And so in particular, I want you to find 10 of these following dates for me. One, I want you to find the time when Abraham was given the covenant of circumcision. Second, I want you to find the date when Moses brought the ten plagues on Egypt. Third, I want you to find out when, jo when Joshua burned the city of Hazor. Fourth, I want you to find the date when Ruth converted to Naomi's religion. Fifth, I want you to find the date when King Jeroboam built his altars in Dan and Bethel. Sixth, I want you to find the date when Isaiah predicted the end of the Syrio-Ephraimitic War. 
Seventh, I want you to find the date when Daniel and his friends were taken captive to Babylon as prisoners. Eighth, I want you to find the time when Nehemiah rebuilt Jerusalem's wall. And our last two will be New Testament era. Number nine, I want you to find the date when Jesus Christ died on the cross. And tenth, I want you to find a date for when Paul wrote the book of Galatians. So, that will do it for the accuracy section, but I would also like for you to have a historical section. And in this, you can plot any ten dates you want. Well, any ten within reason. I am going to put a couple restrictions on you. The first is that all ten of those dates have to be events that were reported in the Bible. And secondly, to help you space those events out, I am requesting that you pick one event from each of these ten time periods. And the time periods are as follows. One is the Patriarchal Era, so one event between 2200 BC and 1805 BC. The second era is the era of Israelite captivity in Egypt, which goes between 1805 BC and 1446 BC. The third era is the era of the Exodus and the conquest of Canaan between 1446 BC and 1350 BC. The fourth era is the era of the Judges between 1350 BC and 1050 BC. The fifth era will be the era of the United Monarchy between 1050 and 930 BC. The sixth era will be the era of the Divided Monarchy between 930 BC and 586 BC. The seventh era will be the era of the Judean Exile, which is between 586 BC and 539 BC. The eighth era will be the post-exilic period, which is between 539 BC and 425 BC. The ninth era will be the intertestamental period between 425 BC and 6 BC. And then finally, the last era will be the New Testament era, and that will be between 6 BC and 100 AD. Next, I want your timeline to display relative distances. You see, good timelines show distances that are relative. And your time timeline won't really help anyone tell uh, dates unless they can show how far apart dates are and use a consistent scale to do that. So, for example, in the timeline that I provided in this slide, 10-year periods are marked off in even and equal increments. Your timeline should do the same. If you want a good rule of thumb, I usually recommend that 1 inch equals 100 years is a fairly good scale to use. Now, throughout this class, I will be showing you several types of timelines so that you'll get a feel for what you could be trying to make on your own. And it will also give you a pretty good idea of what I'm looking for in your timelines. In fact, why don't you go ahead and pause this video right now and download the timeline entitled Israel's History Master Timeline from your LMS. Next, I want your timeline to be attractive, to have a decent appearance. It should be appealing to look at. And you could lose as much as a letter grade if the timeline looks sloppy, has too many mistakes, or it just looks like you slapped it together the night before it was due. So, in short, take pride in your work. I'm hoping that you will make this timeline a resource that you will use over and over again throughout your time here at MacU. Whew. So, now that you've done all that, I want you to do one more thing for this timeline project. I want you to include a works cited bibliography for every book that you consulted to figure out these dates. In particular, I want you to use at least five sources, although, to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if that number was closer to 10 or 15 if you did this project well. Just like all the other assignments, I want you to use the Turabian format for citing your bibliography. And if you're having trouble formatting your bibliography correctly, I suggest several helpful websites. Probably the easiest to use is easybib.com, which will show you the proper formatting for nearly any book you can find. So, let me recap this. I want you to make an attractive timeline of biblical events and I want you to show relative temporal distances that are consistent and accurate. I want you to find the dates for 10 events that I've listed above, and you may add to that 10 more dates for the eras I've listed above. 
And finally, I want you to show all your work by including a works cited page of the resources you used to build your timeline. So if this sounds like a lot, well, it is. But take comfort from this reassurance. I believe that you can do it. And if it makes you feel any better, I've made seven timelines for this class. So just keep in mind, any work that I'm asking you to do, I've already done it myself. I'm right there in this with you. We're, you're making a timeline. I'm making timelines. We are making timelines for this class. Okay, so let's talk about the end of the semester. At the end of the eight weeks, I will ask you to make a final exegetical project. And this will show me that you can successfully apply many of the things you've been learning throughout this class. So to start off, you'll pick your text, and you may choose one of the following passages of Scripture. You may choose Judges 16, 1 through 22, which is the narrative of Samson and Delilah. You may choose 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 22, which is the narrative of how David spared King Saul's life. You can do a New Testament passage like Mark 7, 31 through 8, 13, which details Jesus' ministry in a land known as the Decapolis. Or finally, you could choose Acts 23, 12 through 35, and this is the account of Paul being transported as a prisoner from Caesarea under heavy guard. So, please email me as soon as you've decided which text you want to do. This will allow me to supply you with some resources that could potentially help you, or at least give you potentially helpful advice. If you've not chosen a text by the end of the second week in class, I will simply assign you one, and I will send you an email telling you what your passage is. So please, choose your text early, and don't wait till the last week to start on this project. Now, this final project should include the following, and the first thing it should include is a map of the movements of people that are described in your text. Each of these texts involves people traveling from place to place, and you can cite this on a map. Now, in this class, we will work very heavily with maps, but the focus will often be on naming and locating major cities of interest. But the real test of your map comprehension will be your ability to read a Bible passage and make assertions about human travel and movement based on what you know about the geography of the land. Next, I want your project to be submitted as a PowerPoint presentation. And this will be the major difference between this class, GB102 Bible Backgrounds, and the on-campus version as taught by Dr. Bob Smith. You see, normally Dr. Bob would have you do a project that would require you to bring in substantial models and props and demonstrate some aspect of the biblical world and its culture. But since many of you are taking this class are going to live several miles, if not several hundred miles away, like I do, coming to class just and coming to campus just won't be feasible. So instead, I want you to explain a Bible passage using digital media that you can submit to me online. So you should take advantage of this format and use charts and graphs and pictures to help you illustrate the main points of your passage. I would also like you to organize your insights on your passage either chronologically, meaning take it verse by verse, or thematically, that it covers this theme and this theme. If possible, I want you to record your voice with your presentation, just like I'm doing for this lecture here. If you have an older computer or you just can't figure out how to do this, you may type what you would have said in the class notes section of your PowerPoint slide, but regardless, I want there to be some kind of a script that is turned in with this. Now, in addition to that, I want your PowerPoint presentation to have a word study. Now, this word study uh, should use scholarly resources like concordances and theological dictionaries to help you and your audience understand what the important words and phrases in your text actually mean. You will also want to keep in mind that, there are, that these types of resources can be very limited in scope sometimes, so you may want to check with a Bible commentary or two just to confirm that this is indeed what the important word means in this particular passage. And your project should include what is called exegesis and exposition. And by these big words, I simply mean this. In exegesis, I want you to interpret what the original author meant. And specifically, I want you to use the historical critical method of biblical studies to do this. Now, don't panic. 
if you don't know what all this means just yet. We will spend eight weeks trying to figure out how to do this method properly. But for now, it will suffice to say that I want you to begin gathering cultural and geographical facts about the Bible in order to help you bridge the gap between yourself and the scriptural author of your passage. Then, once you've assessed what the original meaning of the text is, then I want you to start making some real-life applications or exposition, both for yourself and for your culture. But I want you to use the original meaning of the text as your foundation. Don't just go shooting off from left field. Have a connection between the exegesis and the exposition. And this f part of the project is the crux of this class. And I dare say this will be the kind of center point of your entire biblical education. You'll be using this process over and over and over again for the next four or more years that you're here at MACU. And for this whole reason, I want you to be able to read the Bible better and I want you to use God's word responsibly. And so if you're going to be doing this over and over and over again, I want you to get in the hang of doing this well. Now, as a person who went to Bible college and as a Christian, I can assure you, you will be using this process for the rest of your life. So take the time now and master these skills that we'll be learning over these eight weeks. I promise you, they will serve you well in the years to come if you do. And finally, just like your timeline project, at the end of, of your final project, I am requesting that you use a works cited bibliography of at least five sources. This bibliography is to be formatted according to the Turabian manual style, and it may be submitted either independently as a Word document, or it may be embedded in the last slide of your PowerPoint presentation. And yes, you may use some of the resources that you've collected and used to draft your timeline as well. I'm not picky that you've reused sources. In fact, I'll be glad to see that you're using good sources more than once. All right, take a deep breath. <sighs> That's going to be a lot of work for this semester. And this last final project can be very time consuming. So don't get overwhelmed. As your professor, I am here to help you succeed. I want to see you do well. And to help you accomplish this, I will be giving you one example per week of what a successful final project could look like. This will help me to demonstrate to you what I'm looking for, and will also help to model a proper technique of what it looks like to do exegesis and exposition. So with that in mind, Take the last 15 minutes of this class, just settle back, and hear this message from God's Holy Word. It's found in 2 Kings chapter 5. Good day. I'd like to start off this presentation today by having you open your Bibles to the book of 2 Kings chapter 5. Now, for most of us, this is a fairly well-known story. I know I remember hearing it when I was in elementary school, and I'd be willing to wager that if you grew up in the church at all, you already know the gist of how the story goes. This is the story of Naaman the Syrian, or Aramean as some translations will call him. He's a man with leprosy who God miraculously heals when he demonstrates his faith in the word of the Lord. Well, that's the basics of the story, but let me just kind of blow your mind right off the bat by asserting this. If this story does not offend you, you may have been reading it wrong. And my proof for this comes from Jesus' own ministry, as it's recorded in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus is quoted as saying this, quote, And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. Yet none of them was cleansed except for Naaman the Syrian. Unquote. And when they heard this, all the people of the synagogue were filled with rage, and they got up and they forced him out of town. They brought him to the bow of a hill, on which their town was built, and so that they could throw him down off the cliff. That sounds pretty brutal there, doesn't it? Not the kind of reaction you expect when someone goes out preaching. Well, or at least it's not the reaction I expect when I go out preaching. No one has tried to kill me yet. But keep this idea in the back of your mind. This passage about Naaman, when properly interpreted, should cause people of faith to get just a little bit edgy. So, let's begin by asking, what is a Syrian? Or, I think more to the point, what was the opinion of the average Israelite of the Syrians in the 8th century BC? 
Well, the simple answer to this is, it's not a good opinion at all. For example, a Syrian artifact that's known as the Tel Dan Stila records that the king of Syria, a man named Haziel, in 841 BC invaded the northern territories of Israel and destroyed many of their cities, and he made the people pay tribute, which is basically protection money, to keep Haziel from destroying even more cities. Haziel also claims to have been a major player in the deaths of King Jehoram of Israel and King Ahaziah of Judah an event that the Bible itself attributes to Jehu, the usurper king of Israel. And in addition to this, the prophet Elisha predicts the damage that Haziel will do when he predicts this. He says, quote, Because I know the trouble you will cause to the Israelites. You will set fire to their fortresses. You will kill their young men with the sword. You will smash their children to bits, and you will rip open their pregnant women. Unquote. In short, the average Israelite would have probably called the Syrians terrorists if they had lived in our day and age. They were the kind of people that would attack you for no good reason. They would take your stuff, they would kill your children and your wife, and they'd burn your house down. Now, I'm saying this as dramatically as I can so that I hope you're starting to generate a strong dislike for this kind of a person. Because that's exactly how the original Israelite audience would have reacted reading this book of Second Kings. They would have heard the term Syrian, and they would have gotten angry, defensive, possibly even irate. So now let's turn our attention to Naaman himself. Second Kings 5 records it this way. Now Naaman was the commander of the king of Syria's army, and he was esteemed and respected by his master, for through him the Lord had given Syria military victories. But this great warrior had a skin disease. Now raiding parties went out from Syria and took captives from the land, a young Israelite girl who became a servant to Naaman's wife. Unquote. And this is where the main character of our Bible passage becomes implicated in the problem that is Syria. As the commander of the Syrian army, he had already taken part in raiding parties, and he'd even made a slave out of at least one of the Israelite people, and presumably more. And I find it notable that the parents of this young girl are not mentioned in this text. Did Naaman and his men kill them on one of their raids? Was she simply captured while her parents were still in Israel and they're wondering what happened to her? Another problem, is her slavery only manual labor? Or is she being sexually abused, as was often the case with slaves taken during this time? Simply put, if Naaman were a person doing this kind of thing today in our culture, he would be the equivalent of the antagonist from the movie Taken, with the only exception that this poor little girl doesn't have a Liam Neeson character as a father to single-handedly destroy the Syrian army. But we also learn something else about Naaman from this passage. He has a skin disease. The word in this passage is the Hebrew word metzora, and it's the passive form of the verb tsara, which means to be struck with a skin disease. There's quite a lot of debate about what kind of skin-related problem Naaman actually suffered from, as this word can apply to a wide variety of skin afflictions in the same way that our word cancer can describe both malignant and benign tumors. In the best case scenario, Naaman has a disease probably like um, eczema, in which uh, case his skin would have turned red, itchy, and possibly scaly in the affected areas. But worst case scenario, he would have had what was called Hansen's disease, or leprosy. Now, most modern Bible translations choose to go with this worst case scenario, as Hansen's disease is life-threatening, and it gives Naaman more of a reason to travel to a distant land to find a cure. But there's also a second possibility why Naaman is so urgent in his search for a cure, and that has to do with the ancient Near Eastern ideas of purity. For example, in the biblical book of Leviticus, a person who contracts a skin disease, and if it can't be cured after seven days, that person has to live in isolation away from the people, just in case so they won't give the disease to anyone else. And furthermore, such a person who gets a disease like this, they had to burn any of their clothing that showed signs of contamination, and such a person couldn't be allowed in the temple at all to worship. 
and some commentators assume that Naaman is also prohibited from worshipping at the Temple of Rimon in Damascus. That would be his god because of his skin disorder as well. Now, a final issue associated with this word of skin disorders is that it was often taken as a sign from God that, he was, that God was punishing a person for their sins. This happens in the case of Miriam in uh, Numbers uh, chapter 12, and in the case of Gehazi later in this text in 2 Kings 5. However, God's displeasure with Naaman is really hard to decipher from this text because the opening verse suggests that Israel's God himself was actually helping Naaman secure his victories. And this would have probably left the original audience a little confused. Was God immediately punishing Naaman for his sins, even though at the exact same time he's using Naaman as an in instrument of God's wrath against Israel? Well, the text leaves this question open to speculation. But in all likelihood, the original audience of this book would have heard that this Syrian, who, quite frankly, was in the business of raiding Israelite villages and killing their people and taking slaves, he had contracted a skin disease. And their most likely reaction would have been to say, good, I hope his skin rots and falls off his body for all the harm he's done to us. So let's talk about Naaman's travels here. After his Israelite slave tells him that there's a prophet in Samaria who could cure him, Naaman immediately goes to the king who gladly gives him permission to travel to Samaria. Now, Naaman takes some money along to help pay for his healing. In particular, he brings 10 talents of silver, 6,000 pieces of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. And, well, the question for us today is, well, really, how much did this amount of money weigh? And I'm going to suggest that a good rule of thumb is that one talent weighs about 75 to 85 pounds. And this means that Naaman is bringing about 800 pounds of silver and possibly another 50 to 200 pounds of gold, depending on how big those gold pieces actually are. The clothing, in case you're curious, probably weighed as much as a full laundry basket. So, in short, he has about half a ton of metal that he's carrying with him. And it may be worth keeping in mind that King Omri paid two talents of silver to buy a whole mountain where he built the capital city of Samaria on. We're talking a lot of money. And another potentially abrasive fact is that this gold and silver was probably taken from the Israelites in Naaman's raids. And so we're really discussing kind of a horrific triangular trade route. Naaman steals from the Israelites. He then brings the money back into Israel to pay for a disease he's contracted. So let's talk about this half a ton of metal some more because Unless you use that metal and turn it into a transformer, it isn't going to walk itself from Damascus to S Samaria. And a half a ton of metal isn't easy to hide either. So odds are Naaman had to load all this treasure onto either donkeys or mules, and then he would probably need an armed escort of soldiers just to keep it all safe. So picture this, if you will. We have 10 to 20 donkeys carrying bags of gold and silver, and probably 10 to 50 armed guards, including several other slaves, traveling behind this man all, who's got this horrible skin disease. So now that you've got that picture in your mind of what Naaman's entourage looks like, let's see how far that money had to move or travel. Starting in Damascus, where Naaman's king lived, Naaman would have traveled downhill along the International Coastal Highway through the highlands of a place called Bashan. And he'd go south around the imposing summit of Mount Hermon. And once around Hermon, his road would have dropped steeply about 2,000 feet in elevation into the Hula Basin, where he'd finally arrive at the city of Dan. And this is the northernmost part of Israel in her history. It's about a 50-mile journey so far. Now, from Dan, Naaman and his company would have had to turn south along the rim of the Hula Basin. The inner part of the basin was way, way too swampy to accommodate safe travel. So luckily for Naaman, he, this whole area is a fairly flat stretch of about 38 miles. He would r run past the ruins of Hatzor, and he would continue along fairly flat ground until he passed the Sea of Galilee. But too bad for Naaman, that last leg of his journey is going to be the hardest. Samaria, the city itself, rests on a high ridge high above the Jezreel Valley. So to get there from the Sea of Galilee, Naaman would have had to cross the valley to Megiddo, turn south along the Central Ridge route, 
and from there he would have had to travel uphill past the cities of Ibliam, Dothan, and finally, after 128 miles of traveling, he would arrive at the city of Samaria. And odds are this kind of a journey with uh, non-engine uh, powered vehicles would have lasted about two to three weeks. So when Naaman finally gets to Samaria, he delivers a letter to the king, King Jehoram, the king of Israel. Jehoram is the son of the evil king Ahab, and the text of 2 Kings makes every attempt to show that Jehoram is just as faithless as his father was. Now, he's going to read Naaman's letter, and he's going to rip his clothes as a sign of mourning. And, this is, and he's going to basically say that this must be an attempt from the king of Syria to provoke a war. Now, it is customary to pick on Jehoram for his lack of faith, but for a moment, try to put yourself in his place. Here's Naaman, a man who had been brutally attacking his people, shows up on his doorstep with somewhere between 10 to 50 armed guards, and he's got a letter saying, heal me of a skin disease that no one knows a cure for. I agree, Jehoram did not see this, this situation through the eyes of faith. But I dare say that most people living today would have probably seen things Jehoram's way as well. So now you're probably asking, well, why didn't Naaman go to Elisha's house directly? Why did he stop to see the king at all? Well, there could be two reasons for this. The first is that Naaman's slave girl has told him that the prophet lives in Samaria which is both a region and a town, kind of like how in the United States we have New York State and the smaller New York City, which is inside New York State. He may have just simply assumed incorrectly that she meant the city instead of the region. The other possibility, though, is that Naaman may have mistaken how prophets functioned in Israel. You see, in most of the ancient Near East, the job of a prophet was to support the king and legitimize his reign. In short, Naaman comes, where Naaman comes from, uh, the prophets are the king's servants, and it's their job to make the king look good. It's their job to tell the king exactly what he wants to hear from the gods. In Israel, though, true prophets were often antagonistic to kings, unless they followed God's law very well. So, Naaman may have gone to see the king, figuring that any prophet with any real power would just be in the king's service. Well, in either case, he guessed wrong. And as a result, King Jehoram proved to be very little help to him. Now, it's at this point that Elisha saves the day and agrees to meet with Naaman. The text states that Naaman rides out to Elisha's house with his servants and his chariot. The chariot, which is the Hebrew word rekev, was the premier war machine of the 8th century BC. These two-wheeled vehicles were often pulled by two to four horses, and they served as armored platforms for shooting arrows. In short, Naaman has just pulled up to the prophet's house in the 8th century BC equivalent of a tank or a fighter jet. And we're talking both in terms of cost, how much it costs to make one, and in terms of awesomeness, how it tends to put peasants in their place. And anyone watching could have seen that a very important person has just come to see Elisha. Now, Elisha seems to be highly unimpressed, and so he sends his servant out to tell Naaman to go wash seven times in the Jordan River. <laughs> Burn! Naaman just came all this way, and the prophet won't even give him the time of day to step out of his house and say hello. Now the original audience of this text at this moment is probably overjoyed that here is this bad Syrian coming in in his bad old chariot, and he just totally gets disrespected by the prophet. Now, at this point, most of us usually feel like Naaman has become a chronic whiner. Elisha tells him to go wash seven times in the Jordan River, and most of us would probably think, well, how hard can that be? Well, before you pass judgment, picture this. The 25-mile trip from Samaria to the Jordan requires travel through some pretty gnarly terrain. In fact, Naaman must follow the Wadi Farah, which at this time is probably a dry riverbed this time of year, for about 25 miles, and it's a drop of nearly 4,000 feet in elevation. This is a drop of 1,000 feet every 7 miles or so, and that's a nasty descent by anyone's standards, to, even today. Additionally, the Jordan River literally means the down-goer. 
it goes downhill so fast it picks up tons of sediment and debris and as a result it's a very very muddy river and Naaman is right when he complains that Damascus has much better and cleaner rivers than Israel does <laughs> quite frankly it does and sadly even though it's a longer trip mileage wise going back the way he came from may have been an easier route than taking all of his equipment and material and traveling downhill to the Jordan River. So predictably, Naaman tries to walk off angry and in a huff. But then his servants remind him of a different perspective. They tell him that Elisha has not asked him to do something difficult. Well, besides to haul half a ton of gold and silver down a 5,000 foot ravine. But other than that, in the ancient world, the mark of a great hero was often the willingness to go on an epic quest to achieve the desires of their heart. For example, in the Babylonian epics, a man named Gilgamesh is credited with questing basically to the ends of the earth to find the secrets of immortality. Naaman's servants remind him that he was willing to prove his mettle by doing something hard. So, they ask, why not do something easy? So, now the question I would ask is, why all this rigmarole for poor old Naaman? Well, my guess is this. Naaman needed to have an encounter with Israel's God. You see, if Elisha had simply touched him and prayed for him, as Naaman had expected, he may have attributed his healing to Elisha's superior magic, and not necessarily to the power of Elisha's God. Likewise, if the river was the cleaning agent, then Naaman may have attributed his healing to the clean water if he'd been told to go to a respectable river. By asking Naaman to get into the dirtiest river around, there's only one cause that could account for his healing, the God of Israel. And finally, washing seven times required Naaman to exercise his faith. The text says nothing happened on the first six washes, and so presumably the first six times he dips himself has no effect whatsoever. It seems that only on the seventh dip, the seventh washing, is Naaman cured. Now, once he's healed, in an interesting twist, Naaman returns and attempts to offer Elisha the handsome reward that he was prepared to give in the first place. And Elisha turns it down, only telling Naaman to go in peace. And I'll be honest, this has always been a baffling statement to me. Why did Elisha tell Naaman to, why didn't he say, you need to become circumcised and become an Israelite? Why didn't Elisha condemn Naaman for his willingness to compromise on his faith? You know, he asked, is it okay if I bow in the temple of Rimon when my king asked me to do it? Why doesn't Elisha tell him that, you know, instead of giving me money, why don't you return your poor slave girl back to her parents? But you notice what happens. At best, Elisha only tells Naaman to go home a peaceful man. And at worst, he blesses him and, and to leave in peace, and he asks nothing further from him. And so, this, my friends, is the brutal scandal of God's grace. It meets us where we are. It deals with our own sin and suffering on our own level. And it heals us even though we ourselves are unworthy. But the most scandalous aspect of all, that would have been at least to the original audience when they read this story, is this. Here is Naaman, a terrorist, a slaver, a, tra a slave-trading kidnapper, in, our, in the, at least the eyes of the original audience. And not only does God heal him, but he leaves with God's blessing without even being told, and now you have to follow the law of Moses. So, for us in the New Testament age, this both uh, demonstrates the depths of God's grace, but it also challenges, uh, challenges us to ask this question. Who then can be saved? This text compels us to an answer that anyone, even a terrorist, even a slaver, even someone worse than this, can be apprehended by the grace and mercy of God. And I would like to suggest this is why the people of Nazareth became so upset at Jesus' message. He preached that God's grace could touch anyone, even the most despicable sinners imaginable. 
And the question for us is this. Will we be willing to offer that sort of forgiveness? Will we go out of our way to preach the gospel to those who hate us? To those who would murder our families? To those who would kidnap our children? The God we worship has had mercy on those kind of people in the past. And he continues to have mercy on such people today. Therefore, I tell you, go and do likewise. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Hey, this program was brought to you by Alfred Howarth, Gerald Matley, and Edward Yamauchi in their book, The People of the Old Testament World. This was also brought to you by William L. Holliday and his concise Hebrew Aramaic lexicon. This was brought to you by K.A. Kitchen and the on the reliability of the Old Testament. Also brought to you in part by Wilhelm van Gemmeren and his New International Dictionary of the Old Testament. And finally brought to you by John H. Walton, Ancient Near Eastern Thought and the Old Testament World. Thank you very much and have a good night and may God's grace go with you.